I'm Stuart Hughes, I'm a, a World Affairs producer with BBC News and, and all I'm trying to do today is give you some uh, sense of my experience as life as both an amputee and a journalist. I suppose all the uh, theory and the science that you've been hearing about today, which would have gone right over my head, it ends up with people like me, with, with the amputees themselves. So there's no graphs or slides for me, um, maths and science were never my strong point. But I'm the end user, I'm the person who all this science and all this technology, all these developments you've been hearing about today, uh, hopefully will benefit one day. Um, it's especially good to be here today because many of the people who helped me to get to the stage that I'm at uh, in my recovery are here in this room and, and it may sound like an exaggeration but it's not when I say that, that they're among the most important people in my life because if they do their job properly and probably most of the time they do, uh, I'm able to work full time, I'm able to travel to war zones and hostile environments and I'm also able, more importantly, to try and keep up with my five-year-old son, Billy, which, as anybody who's got children will know, is not always easy. Um, but it is easy to take all of that for granted when things are going well, but it's only when something goes wrong with my leg that I realise just how much I depend on people like you, the prosthetists, the uh, occupational therapists, uh, not only for my physical well-being, but also my psychological well-being, something that's sometimes overlooked, because there's nothing more depressing than being off your leg for a week. It's very demoralizing when you're having problems, as anybody uh, who's an amputee would be able to tell you. Um, I vividly remember the day when I became an amputee. It was April the 2nd, 2003, and on that day I smelled explosives and burnt meat, and I knew in an instant that my life would never be the same again. I was on assignment for BBC News in northern Iraq, and one spring morning um, we traveled to a former frontline position in a town called Kifri, which is about 80 miles from Baghdad. And a few days earlier, it had been bombed by American planes and it forced Saddam Hussein's forces, who were already weakened, to abandon their trenches and, and, and flee towards Baghdad. And in the previous days, there had been a lot of mortar attacks and a lot of incoming fire, but when we got there, uh, some of that uh, mortar fire had subsided, and so we took a young uh, Kurdish soldier with us as our escort, who assured us that the area that we were travelling in was safe. But unfortunately, as I was to find out, he was wrong. Uh, and just seconds after stepping out of our vehicle, I triggered a landmine that was hidden beneath the grass. Uh, it might have been there for years, it might have been freshly buried, I'll probably never know, because one of the most pernicious things about landmines is that they can lay in the ground for decades undisturbed, but still dangerous. The Cambodians call landmines eternal sentinels because they're cheap, they cost just a few pounds. They're very durable, they're easy to, trans easy to transport, and as I found out on April the 2nd, 2003, they are also brutally effective. Uh, the mine I stepped on is called a PMN. It's one of the most commonly used landmines in the world. There are millions of them littered in battlefields all over the world. It's only the size of a tin of travel suites, just a small thing but it contains 240 grams of high explosives and with an evil precision that the engineers among you may appreciate, it's designed perfectly not to kill but just to maim, to slow down and demoralise an army that's trying to advance by ripping off limbs and driving dirt and bone fragments up inside the body. In my case it blew off my right heel. Um, I was to later find out that I got off extremely lightly because the underside of the jeep I'd stepped out of when we examined it later, it was peppered with small puncture holes that had gone right through the metal chassis. Now, I got no doubt that the jeep, because I'd just stepped out of it, it absorbed a lot of the blast and without doubt saved me from much more serious injury. If I'd stepped on that landmine in open ground, I've got no doubt I would have lost um, both of my legs or even worse. Um, as you can imagine, in the seconds that followed, they were filled with fear, with confusion, with disorientation, just not knowing what had happened. All I knew was I heard an explosion and I was injured. Uh, I was chatting with a cameraman, an Iranian photojournalist called Kaveh Golistan, and he instinctively thought, as we all did in that instant, that we were coming under mortar fire. Uh, he tried to run for safety away from the vehicle that he thought was being attacked and um, targeted from a distance, but of course he ran further into the minefield and stepped on one line, landmine and fell forward onto a second and Carve was killed almost instantly. I was dazed but I was still conscious and unsure 
how severe my injuries were. But the one thing I did know in that instant from the battlefield training that I had was that if I looked down and looked at my foot too closely, I, I was pretty sure I was going to pass out just from the shot, and that would leave me and my team in even greater danger. At least I was conscious, at least I was lucid, and that gave me you know, the best possible chance. But so as I lay there wondering on what to do next, I, after a few minutes, looked down at my foot, and I saw a mass of blood and bone. The skin around it was blown apart, and my foot just looked like a lump of plasticine. Uh, the correspondent I was working with, a colleague called Jim Muir, showed extraordinary bravery, some would say bravery, some would say stupidity, um, by extracting us from the minefield by reversing back along the road that we just followed on the way in by following the tyre tracks that had been left by the grass being pushed down. Um, my colleagues in London um, got in touch with the Pentagon in Washington and US Special Forces surgeons were dispatched to give me emergency treatment in Iraq and then I was flown back to the UK via Cyprus. Um, but any chance of saving my foot had already evaporated. I'd undergone several quite uh, vigorous debridements in the days that followed to try and cut down the chance of infection and remove all the, the muck and dead tissue that had been blown into my body. Um, I didn't really realise it at the time and I probably wouldn't have believed it if anybody told me, but I'm glad in retrospect that I didn't have to choose between an amputation and a long and possibly fruitless programme of reconstructive surgery. And now I know there are doctors here among you and, and I'm not going to speak for you, but you may feel that you failed if you can't save a, a limb. Um, you know, the doctor's job is, to, is to, to save people, to help people, but for me the prospect of being fitted with an artificial limb and getting back on my feet as quickly as possible was far more appealing than spending months in a wheelchair undergoing multiple operations that may not work anyway. So even though I had no choice, I was glad not to be given a choice because I, I think the result was better in the, in the long term. And, and so five days after stepping on that landmine, my right leg was amputated below the knee and I began my rehabilitation at Rookwood Hospital in Cardiff where some of the colleagues from Rookwood are here today. Now I know many of you work with uh, patients who've recently undergone amputations. Um, I think it's fair to say we can be a demanding bunch at the best of times. It's a confusing, anxious time uh, for us and our families and the need for reassurance both for me and for my family and answers to the many, many questions that I had was great. So I was asking questions like, will I be able to work again? Yes, you'll be able to work again, very patiently. Will I be able to walk? Will I walk with a limp? Yes. Well, you might have a slight limp, but it's, it's going to get better over time. Will I be able to play sport? Well, you probably won't be playing football for Wales again, but yeah, you'll be, you know, you'll be okay. You'll be okay with that. I know there are people here from Headley Court, and I'm a blown out knee amputee, so I've, I've learned that head, in Headley Court parlance, so I'm also known as a, a scratcher. Um, the lowest of the low in the amputee pecking order, I subsequently found out, um, with my mere flesh wound. Um, I know that now, but at the time I couldn't resemble my life returning to anything even approaching normality, but thankfully I was proved wrong and six months after my amputation I returned to work as a, as a BBC producer doing the job that I loved. I quickly learned that life as an amputee does have some obstacles that people with two legs don't face, as the amputees here in the room will be able to attest. Uh, worst of all is the metal in the artificial leg sets off the scanners at airports, and it's hard to remain polite and calm sometimes when you walk through the scanner at the, at the airport and they send you back, and you say it's just going to go off again. And they send you back and you go through again, and they send you back. Um, and so, as a preemptive measure, I've learned the phrase, I have an artificial leg in a variety of languages, which I keep in my notebook, and that sometimes, <laughs> that sometimes does the trick if communication is, is a problem. Um, I've had to tell my life story to security guards in African airports who, when they roll up my trouser leg and see my leg, can't believe that a white Westerner could have befallen the same fate that... Um, befalls countless landmine victims in countries from Angola to Mozambique. And I think what's most affecting of all is when I travel to countries like Cambodia and you see amputees with injuries no worse than mine forced to beg on the streets because life in countries like Cambodia is hard in the first place. 
And having a disability means opportunities to work and to provide for your family are virtually non-existent. And there's also a great deal of stigma there. And disability carries a huge stigma. Uh, and in, in, in Buddhist countries, sometimes it's seen as a, as a punishment for a wrongdoing in a past life. I traveled some years ago to northern Cambodia, near the border with Thailand. And I saw landmine victims there walking through the paddy fields with legs made from coke bottles, rocket casings, bamboo sticks, basically whatever they could find and whatever they could lash together. I saw amputees wearing no legs at all, using just crutches to get around. And I asked the people I was traveling with from a landmine charity why they were using crutches when there were charities available providing artificial legs at low cost. But the answer was simple, of course, they're, they're subsistence farmers. If they leave their land for any length of time to go and do their rehabilitation um, and learn to walk with an artificial leg, their crops won't be tended and their families won't be fed. It's as simple as that. Um, I was lucky. I had six months to recover. These people don't. And so they were forced to adapt to their disability in the best way they could, even though better alternatives were available. <coughs> but I was also privileged in Cambodia to spend time with a demining team made up almost entirely of landmine victims whose legs are made especially by the Red Cross and uh, their legs have no metallic parts so they don't set off the metal detects in the minefields, just the sort of thing you need for going through those airport scanners. And one evening after a day in the minefield I was sitting with them on a log and I, I, we started chatting about legs and they asked me how much my leg cost. And, and talking about money is always a, a bit of a vulgar subject and I didn't want to insult them by quoting a figure that would probably be more money than they would earn in a lifetime. So I did what any good journalist does in this situation and decided to tell a little lie. <laughs> I said, oh, it's about a thousand dollars. They looked at me, they looked at each other and they started conferring and looked at each other. I thought, oh, God, maybe I've upset them by talking about money. And then they looked at me and they burst into, burst, burst into laughter. And they said, a thousand dollars, a thousand dollars. You could buy a whole herd of cattle for that. Why are you wasting your money on a leg? <laughs> so, uh, if there are any private prosthetists in the audience, I would suggest that probably Cambodia is not a good option. <laughs> market, if you're looking to expand your market, Cambodia, just forget it. Um, I would say, though, that since I've become an amputee, I've come to understand that in, in the prosthetics world, um, what's best doesn't always have to mean the most expensive, which I'm sure NHS managers who are trying to balance their books would be glad to hear. Um, for me, it's about finding a balance between cost, function, and reliability, and that's something that's going to be different for every single patient. If I'm working, as I do in places like Iraq, Afghanistan, or the West Bank, I need to know that my foot isn't going to let me down. Uh, if I get shelled, I need to know that I'm going to be able to get out there quickly and my foot is going to help me do that. I need something that's going to give me good mobility, but something that's also durable enough to withstand the beating I'm likely to give it in the field. And it's also got to be simple enough to maintain that even a witless journalist like me carrying a multi-tool and a tub of grease can do some running repairs and get going again. Um, it may sound like a strange thing to say, but it seems to me that there's never been a better time to be an amputee. I wouldn't encourage it as a lifestyle choice, but <laughs> if you're going to be one, well, now's a pretty good time to be one. And there's two reasons for that. I mean, the social reason, um, I've seen even in the time that I've been an amputee, um, society, certainly in the UK, has changed. I think other countries lag behind, and I think charities like Health for Heroes have played a huge part in making amputees more visible. Um, and so that when I wear my shorts in the summer, People often ask me about my leg, but they don't see it as something out of the ordinary. They're just generally curious and interested rather than scared. So as well as the social aspect, there's also the technological aspect of things that you've been focusing on here today. Um, and I can see, just again, in the time that I've been an amputee, that technology is allowing people like me to live ever more normal, active, fulfilled lives. I recently went for an appointment at Charing Cross Hospital, um, where I uh, get my treatment and I was chatting with a gentleman who'd been a, a low knee amputee since the 1960s. Uh, I was genuinely shocked to hear what life was like for him when he first became an amputee. He told his stories of leather harnesses and straps and legs that didn't fit and got hot and chaffed and so on. And it made me realise how far we've come in a relatively short time. Now I know 
that health service budgets are tight, tighter than ever. But for me, being fitted with a prosthesis that allows me to live my life to the full makes perfect financial sense. In terms of my burden on the health service, well, I'm fitter, not as fit as I'd like to be, but fitter and more active. I'm able to work full time and contribute to society just like anyone else. My mental health is better, and I only darken the doors of the hospital when I absolutely have to. Yes, in purely administrative terms, if you look at a piece of paper, I am disabled, I have a disability. If you took my leg off me and ran off with it, I would struggle to catch up with you. But nine years on from my amputation, most of the time, 99% of the time I would say, I don't feel any more disabled than someone who wears glasses or someone who wears a leg brace because their knees are given out from playing too much tennis. I wake up in the morning, I put on my leg, I take my five-year-old to school and then I cycle six miles to work. Having an artificial leg is part of who I am and I'm certainly not ashamed of it, but it doesn't define me. And I never would have believed it nine years ago when I began my rehabilitation at Rookwood Hospital in Cardiff, but nine years on, I'm able to say pretty confidently that having an artificial leg doesn't hold me back. Thank you very much.